Welcome to Fjorda, Ark's latest upcoming official map, releasing in June of 2022. Based on the Scandinavian regions, Fjordor is a cold map which has four main islands as well as three mystical expansive realms to be explored. The main map also boasts pre-built huge castles, dangerous caves and many easter eggs to discover along the way. While we're still a few months away from the official release, I thought I may as well get ahead of the curve and in this video I will attempt to survive 100 days on Fjordor. To spice things up a bit, I've also enabled hardcore mode which means a single death will spell the end of everything. Before we begin, a couple of quick announcements to make. First I'd like to thank you all for your support on my 100 Days of Ragnarok episodes and helping me to reach over 1000 subscribers. All your support is greatly appreciated and if you do enjoy this video please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I do love making these types of videos for you guys but my god they take a long time to record, edit and finally script so your support is greatly appreciated. Secondly if you fancy watching my next 100 Days challenge I will be streaming it live over on Twitch so come on over, give me a follow and join the streams. Thank you for your time and without further ado let's get into the video. On day one we spawned on the beaches of the southeast. Having never played Fjordor before and knowing very little about the map, this was just a guess of a friendly starting location. The beaches at least look relatively friendly, so I began this 100 days challenge in the same way everyone starts Ark, by picking some bushes and punching some trees. After gathering enough resources to make the early game essentials, such as cloth armour and some early game weapons, I made my way down to the beach, where I found this random patch of sand that I could gather sand from. After that strange encounter, I made my way back into the jungle, where I made some spears and then chased this level 50 moss chops down so I could get some hide. After grabbing the hide, I returned to the coast where I spotted this flying stone in the air which I assumed to be an obelisk. While I could have just waited to confirm this at a later date, my curiosity got the better of me and instead of sticking to the beaches like a level 10 man in cloth armour should do, I decided I wanted to go check this thing out. To give me a bit more safety on my journey, I decided to make some boulders and sure enough as I closed in on the flying stone, I encountered my first group of raptors. After accidentally straying too close to this one and aggroing it, I had no choice but to make a run for it. I bowled the raptor and then continued up the hill without looking back. After making it up the hill, I realised that my flying stone was located in the snow biome, and the big issue there, aside from the multitude of dangerous predators lurking around every corner, was that it was rather cold. I made up a campfire and started cooking some meat up, before deciding to brave it and entering the snow biome. Safe to say I didn't last very long in there as I watched my health plummet, so I ran away like the man I am. I quickly realised that as night was dawning I had to either quickly make a place to stay the night or abandon my quest. Just as night struck and I began to freeze to death I managed to get a roof over my head. With a now beautifully furnished wooden house, my torch and another campfire I had a place to spend the night. The next day I awoke from my slumber eager to see what the day had in store for us. After making some hide armour with my leftover hide I could now finally venture into the snow biome without freezing to death. I snuck back up the ramp and then ran away once again as there was a carno right near the cliff edge. I returned to my base and made a bow and arrows in case I needed to teach that Kano a lesson. I also made a refining forge as I was eager to upgrade to metal tools as soon as possible. When I checked back again the Kano had moved further away, just enough for me to sneak behind this metal node and grab some metal. Back at base with metal in hand, I lit the forge and let the metal smelt up. I was now out of hide so decided with my newfound weapons at hand I would return to the ramp where I would seen those raptors and see if I could take one of them on. However upon arriving they seemed to have completely disappeared. It did however give me a good chance to look out over the map though and appreciate how stunning it looked. Safe to say I liked what I was seeing so far and was looking forward to the 98 days I had left. While I had no luck with the raptors, my luck did take a turn for the better when I found this dead Argentavis body just randomly close to base. With some hide collected, this was surely my moment to make it to the flying stone. And then I ran into a Daedon. After running into a Daedon, I tried to hide away in my house only for him to start breaking down the walls to my precious abode. I tried bowling him which was success and then began to hit him with stone arrows. The issue was I'm pretty sure he was healing himself faster than I could actually do damage to him so instead I opted to lead him away from base. I led him away, what I thought would be far enough and then bowled him before sprinting back to base. I quickly then made some parachutes in case I needed to do some escaping. Back at base I was just placing a storage box and filling it up with some of my junk then an all too familiar visitor popped back. Going out to confront the pig once again, he decided that I'd obviously hedged up since he last saw me, so instead of attacking me, he opted to run away. That was all the excuse I needed to, run blindly into the snow biome. I'm not sure why I did this and I was probably quite lucky that this challenge didn't end on day 2 here, but to my surprise the ramp that normally had something hostile on seemed to be completely empty. I even found a dead UT bag and grabbed myself some stone arrows as well as my first two drank arrows. I managed to make my way to the flying stone, 
where I confirmed it was indeed an obelisk. I was quite surprised at the array of bosses Fjordor seemed to have, with all three island bosses as well as the Manticore option to choose. While trying to escape the obelisk, I managed to catch the attention of this level 140 Sabre, which you might think was lights out time for me. Luckily the most lethal combination of a bowler and a torch dealt with him. The fire damage that torches actually do is really strong, so honestly, they're probably your best early game weapon. I should definitely use this torch on the Daedon instead of arrows. After successfully venturing out of the snow biome, I was greeted by an all too familiar face, once again back at base. Thankfully for me, he didn't actually clock me this time, which gave me the chance to get safely home. However, I decided this was not the place for me, probably something to do with the Alpha Carno that spawned right outside my front door. So I grabbed my meat, metal ingots and parachuted to freedom towards the safety of the beaches. After eventually landing from my long flight, I did indeed return to the beaches where I found this level 20 Tyranodon. Using the generous gift of the dead Uti, I managed to chunk him out with one perfect arrow to the head. <coughs> with the Tyranodon now taming, I set my sights on a raft, so I could explore the map a bit more. With the raft made and the Tyranodon tamed, we set sail. The first island we ended up at was this swamp island, which was inhabited by your typical swamp creatures. This didn't make it a very friendly place for beginners, and it also had this weird effect on your in-game screen, so I decided to look elsewhere. I was on constant lookout for Elite Six Fees, as I didn't particularly fancy my raft being eaten, and been stranded out at sea with an unsaddled Tyranodon. As the morning of day three dawned, I did indeed run into my first Elite Six Fees. Thankfully for me, he appeared to be stuck, so after carefully hugging the shore, I managed to make it past him. Further up the beach, I ran into another one, who appeared to be similarly stuck. Nonetheless, I made sure to hug the shore, and I passed him also. Just past the second Elite Six Fees, we ended up parking our raft, and headed inland to look for a base spot. Bottles at the ready in case I ran into any hostile creatures, it didn't take me long to come across this large open cave type place. I was immediately attracted to this place due to the amount of metal which spawned, as well as its natural water source, so I figured this would be a good place to begin setting up. Outside my new base location, I began picking fibre and collecting thatch and wood so that I could make a smithy. From there I placed a smithy down on my lovely thatch foundation and immediately made some metal tools, followed by a mortar and pestle so I could start making narcotics. First though, I had to expand for my one foundation, so I began making wooden foundations to expand the base out. When that was done, I split all my stacks of meat so that it would spoil faster, and then started to make some narcotics so I could make some more tranks. Before heading out however, I placed a refining forge down and set to work with filling it up with as much metal as I could. Having so much metal close to me was really invaluable at this early stage of the game. I unlocked the Tyrandon saddle before killing this pesky Microraptor which was just outside the base for its hide. With the hide gathered, I could finally make a Tyrandon saddle and take to the skies even with its 200 stand that it had. The first thing that I did with my new flight ability was to gather some crystal to make a spyglass from the mountain located right on top of base. With the assistance of my awesome spyglass, I knocked out this 135 Tyrandon, which actually had 29 points in melee, which isn't too bad. An important note when it comes to taming flyers is they don't actually have any wasted points, which means points into movement speed. This means you should always be aiming for higher points on a flyer than you would on, let's say, a regular dino. After the 135, I then went and knocked out a 150, which had 31 points in weight, which for early game is a very useful stat on the terror. Fjordor is full of these pre-built houses and buildings, which are admittedly a very cool addition to the map. I tried using I tried using a foundation to place a door on these houses without thinking that fence foundations would have definitely been the best play here. In fact, these houses are probably very livable in with a fence foundation and door placed down, so let me know in the comments if that works for you. As day five struck, I continued to further expand my base before getting this red drop just outside of base, where I caught a couple of nice things. I then placed a few large storage boxes down for additional space before returning to the daily grind of farming metal and making narcotics. Using some of my hard farm metal, I had finally upgraded to a crossbow and decided to test it on this 140 Terror. This 140 had 30 points in HP, so in my mind I was already planning on combining all of the best around on stats that I'd tamed so far. As you'll see, there was way too much to do in this map than to give me any time to focus on around on breeding. While I waited for the two terrors to tame, I stopped off this yellow drop where I got my first flat blueprint of the challenge. I then explored the Redwood biome and found this nice looking lake surrounded by Maywings. Speaking of Maywings, I decided to have a go at taming this 140, but the Maywing had very different ideas. Bye Felicia. Still passing through the Redwoods, I found this nice looking castle, and then stopped off at a nearby mountain to grab some obsidian. Back at base, my collection of terrors was becoming somewhat of an issue, so I looked at the different types of cliff platform that I could make to store them on. Sadly, they were all a bit pricey for me right now. But what I could afford was a pair of scissors. The reason I made some scissors was that I wanted to make the S plus nanny which would help me look after my dinosaur children. For this I needed human hair, so every 5 or so in game days I would cut both my facial and head hair. With that done, on day 8 I had my sights set on getting an Argentavis, so after crafting some trank arrows, the next morning I set up with high hopes of finding one. Not far from base I actually did find this 150, but its stats weren't all that impressive, 
so I decided to leave it and see if I could find anything better. However, my luck didn't seem to improve, although I did find this cool tunnel looking place. After flying into the entrance, I was dismounted, which obviously meant the flies weren't meant to be flown in this place. I did have a little look at what it looked like on foot, but quickly decided that this wasn't for me at this stage in the game. While my luck with the RGs didn't seem to be improving, I did find out the griffins were on this map, so that was cool. Another thing I found out about Fjordor was that it had these harvestable rocks which give giant bee honey. I'm showing where they are on the map now and there's plenty to choose from, so if you need honey and you can't be bothered to tame bees, there's a the place to go. Returning to base with no Argentavis, I decided to turn my attention to a stego so I could harvest narco berries easier. I rather humiliatingly had to finish knocking this one out of a slingshot when I was too poor to afford any more trank arrows. After taming the stego up, I thought I'd take him for a test drive. At first I was a little underwhelmed and then I realised that I needed to change the stego to sharpened plate mode to be able to harvest berries at a decent rate. After my narco berry run, I spent the day farming and crafting, before heading out the next day and settling for the 150 Argentavis with mediocre stats. One of the nicest things about Fjordor is that due to most of the map being quite high up, the archer didn't fly straight up into the air when Torpor running, which presented me with an easy tame. I killed a Rex to get some prime, and patiently waited by it while it tamed up. By day 10, we had finally secured an Argentavis, and I decided to take full advantage of this by making a taming pen to bring creatures home to that I wanted to tame. I made the taming pen using solely stone door frames and fence foundations, and made sure to make it too high so that the bigger creatures couldn't escape. Venturing out once more, I found this giant beaver dam, similar to the ones you find on Ragnarok. Cementing pace was actually a bit of an issue for me on this map, as you'll see later on, so it was important to keep recycling the spawns close to base. On the way back with the pace, I decided to tame this 140 raptor, and then grabbed this level 85 dodic which is in need of a heal, so I left it in the pen to heal up. A creature that I was desperate for was an Anki, and after spending a good half a day searching for a decent level, I finally found a 135 with 25 points of melee. Leaving the Anki to tame up on the dodic to heal, I started to explore the southeastern part of the map, which I hadn't visited yet. Upon approaching this area, it looked very much like a wyvern trench, but to my surprise, it was just a pleasant looking stream, with some crystal harvest actually. At the end of the trench, there was a decently sized cave, with a deep water section also. I used this section to farm silica pearls by hand, but if you do want a cave to breed water dinos in, which also has plenty of land space, this might be the one for you. As I was already close to the snow biome, I took this opportunity to get some organic polymer, so that I could make some cryopods. On the way back to base, I found a yellow drop, where I got a Mastercraft crossbow, which is by far the most useful item I'd received from a drop thus far. Back at base, my Anki was ready to go, so I put him to work, before checking out that I would need to make some cryopods. The main thing that I was missing was oil, so after scouring the waterfront close to base for a short while in an attempt to find some oil, I headed back inland to continue exploring. Exploring Fjordort was some of the most fun I'd had in Ark in a long while, due to these different buildings I was discovering everywhere. This building even had a cave in the back of it, which honestly looked pretty amazing. Had I not already been pretty settled at my current location, I would have probably packed it up at this point and moved here. After exiting the cave, I did realise that oil pumps were on this map. The only issue to this was that I first needed a fabricator, which also required oil, so this wasn't much of an immediate help. On the way back to base, I saw this Quetzal that appeared to be stuck, so I thought I may as well knock it out while I continued to explore. While the Quetzal tamed up, I took a visit to the sulphur fields on Lava Island, as the wiki had told me that there was some oil here. While I found no oil, I did find a far better level dodic than the one currently in my trap, so I brought him back with me. When knocking a dodic out, make sure its health doesn't go too low, otherwise it will sink into a ball and you will be unable to apply much torpor to it at all. After knocking the dodic out, I thought it deserved a well earned rest, so with no roof yet on my head, I placed a bed next to my campfire and went to sleep for the rest of the day. The next morning, I woke up eager to complete my oil quest, and after a bit of research online, I found out about this island in the southern part of the map which has oil spawns and metal. Feeling accomplished, I returned home to craft some pods, only to get distracted by the strange cave. From the outside, I would have guessed it was an aberration cave, and upon entering it, I was chased out by a pack of ravengers, which pretty much confirmed my suspicion. With the oil now in my possession, I could finally craft cryopods, so I crafted as many as I could at the green obelisk. At base, I finally made myself a fabricator, placed it down, and then used it to make some electronics and an oil pump. I had seen an oil vein just outside the base, without actually realising that there was one inside my base location, but more on that later. The next day, I returned to the southwest of the map, where I had begun on day one, and I found this shipwreck. When you hit the barrels or boxes, it rewards you with pretty good early game loot, it has to be said. No use to me at this stage, but well worth it if you fancy some early game loot. The reason I had returned here was to visit the snow biome to tame a mammoth. After searching around for quite some time, I finally found this 140, who passed out conveniently on top of a rock. I waited at a render distance for the mammoth to tame up, and that night I was blessed to a surprise. The Fjordor map is based on the Scandinavian region, so I thought it was an incredibly neat addition for them to include the Northern Lights. I'm not sure if these are random events, or if you can only see them in the snow at night, but this was the only time during my 100 days on this map I saw the Northern Lights. 
Anyway, as lovely as the lights were, it was now time to return to base with the mammoth. I immediately made a saddle for it and went on a wood run, as I decided it was finally time I put a roof over my head. I also added a stone fireplace and decided to make the base fully stone, as I think stone is probably the most aesthetically pleasing material on Ark. While on the last wood run, I checked on the oil pump to see that it was producing oil, but at a rather slow rate. It's safe to say that while oil pumps are still good, they're much better in an online setting, when they can continue harvesting even when you are offline. The last touch I had to do at base was to add some stone behemoth gates to stop any wild intruders from entering. While it wasn't my finest work, I was happy that it would at least do what it was meant to. On day 20, I continued to explore the caves of Fjordor. I first came across this lava cave, which also, like most of the caves on this map, wasn't flyer friendly. After making it down to the bottom, I couldn't particularly see what the cave had to offer, I have to say. I think it has some loot crates in it, but I'm not sure if there's any artifacts in here. The second cave was a bit more interesting to explore. Located in the southwest of the map, while there didn't seem to be any creatures in here, down the bottom lit a full aberration zone which I explored. I was originally hoping this cave had some fungal wood so that I could make some cliff platforms, but it didn't seem to. The caves of Fjordor are huge, and there are some which I 100% believe there are much more to than I had time to show in this video. After exiting the cave, I quickly embarrassed myself by trying to tame a Tropogamphus by locking it out when it's actually a passive tame. After that, I took a visit to the Wyvernscar on Lava Island. It was certainly not looking Argentavis friendly, and I would need a much faster flyer before I could get wyvern eggs, so I left in search of something else. That night, after brutally murdering its parents, I found a 145 Deinonychus egg, before bumping into this 145 Rex right nearby. One of my main aims on Fjordo when I start this 100 day series was to do as many of the bosses as I could manage in 100 days, and for that I would certainly need some Rexes. This 145 had 26 points in HP, which isn't too bad, so I set about taming it. For the most part, it was a relatively easy tame, until she decided to do a tamer's worst nightmare and run into the water. Luckily for me, the Rex decided to pass out right on top of this rock. Whether she would have drowned or not, I don't know, but I'm glad I didn't have to find out. Behind this waterfall was a mini cave, which would actually land right up until you pass the waterfall. After almost bleeding my Argy to death while killing an aloe to get some prime for the Rex, I waited with it while it tamed up, and I was pleasantly surprised to see that it actually came out with 41 points in HP. After acquiring the Rex, I briefly explored the waterfall cave. It was nothing special, but probably quite a hidden spot for a small, newly starting tribe. At base, I threw out the Rex, and then cut my hair for the last time, before making the S Plus Nanny, which I placed right outside the base. In order to power her, I needed to make a generator, which I did, along with the cables needed to power it up. I also made three air cons so I could hatch Danonicus egg, and start breeding Rexes once I had a mate boosted pair. After successfully placing the air cons down inside the base, for the time being at least, I hatched the egg. It came out with 24 points in HP, which I think is okay, although I must confess to not being brilliantly educated on what good Dane stats are. I brought the baby Dane outside the base, where I placed a feeding trough to feed its needs once it passed the baby stage, and then used a self carno which was just below base to level my newly tamed Rex. I let the Rex heal up, and then finally made a couple of canteens which I filled up at my very own stream. I then decided it was time to upgrade to a better flyer. While I was very fond of my Argentavis, I was spending days travelling around the map due to its slow speed, so I made a trap for a griffin. I had spotted a 145 nearby, so after successfully luring it to the trap and closing the gate behind it, I managed to knock it out. I then killed this nearby Alpha Carne for Prime and finished taming it up. With a griffin now mine, it felt so good to be able to fly at fast speeds again, so naturally the first place I took it was the Wyvern Pit. After spotting this level 170 fire egg, I first had to lure the Wyverns out of the trench before I could have a chance to take it. After successfully doing so and distracting them on the nearby wildlife, I swooped back down into the trench to grab the egg. Even after getting away, my curiosity got the better of me, and I wanted to check out the cave at the bottom of the trench. Surprise surprise, the cave wasn't flyable in, so I abandoned that mission for now and returned to base. Back at base, we had just hit day 30, as I placed the wyvern egg down to incubate. I then discovered I was literally sitting on an oil vein this whole time, so I grabbed the crystal I needed to make another oil pump, and I now had two on the go, which would quicken up my oil production. The wyvern hatched and came out with 32 points in melee, which is actually pretty good. The next day I returned to rex hunting, but the only Rex I seemed to be finding were ones that died to Dimorphodons. After a bit of searching, I finally managed to find this white 150 Rex with 26 points in melee. Unfortunately for me, it was a female, which meant we still didn't have a mate boosted pair of Rexes, but I did decide to tame it up anyway. After gathering some prime for the Rex, I waited through the night, with only my torch stopping me from freezing, and as morning struck, the Rex tamed up. It did come out with 36 points in melee, which, while isn't great, it was a lot better than what I had. I think it is important to stress here that stats in single player do seem to be boosted. For example, 36 points in melee on single player seems to give a much higher percentage in melee than I'd be used to on an online official server, for example. My wife had now finished growing up, so I took him out to get some levels, which I swiftly had to stop after a Stego used its speed effect on me. While I let the wyvern heal, I went looking for something to tame, 
and came across this level 130 Sarko. With expert precision, I managed to pick the Sarko up out of the water, first attempt, and bring him back to base. Those who have watched my Ragnarok 100 Day series knows that the Sarko was my water mount of choice back then, and I saw no reason to change it here. While the Sarko tamed up back at base, I took a trip to Lava Island, where I attempted to tame this level 140 Velonosaur. This was all going relatively well, despite it breaking parts of my armour, until I missed my final shot and the Vlonosaur decided that he would rather die than be tamed by me. Probably fair enough. I then parachuted back onto my wyvern as I managed to get stuck on the cliff edge and left to go get some more cementing paste. I followed this up by going for a little metal run above base and a wood run with the mammoth, before grabbing another giant beaver dam for some paste. On my travels once more, I returned to the wyvern pit and became certain of one thing, only fire wyverns spawned in this pit on Lava Island. This made me wonder if there were trenches somewhere else on the map for poison, ice or lightning wyverns, but having explored most of the map by this point, I began to wonder whether this was possible. After kiting the necessary wyverns out of the pit, I actually grabbed this 175 fire egg and returned back to base to hatch it. It came out with 37 points in HP, which is a pretty decent starting HP stat for wyverns, so I was quite happy with this one. Returning back out, I found this level 140 rex, which at first I considered not taming. Its pre-tamed stats are actually very average, but due to the fact it was a male, and it was in an absolutely ideal position to be knocked out, I decided to go for it. I was pleasantly surprised to see it come out with 43 points in HP, and you can see here as I name it, I was very happy with the outcome of this tame. With mate boosted rexes now a thing, I immediately started breeding them, as well as my fire wyvern pair. The first rex that came out was actually a perfect female, as it had the best melee stat and the best HP stat. The other one was a male with the second best HP in melee stats, so I decided I would raise this one also and use it to explore some of the caves I had already seen, such as the Aberration Cave. When the Absurd Rex had finished growing up, I took him out to get some levels with, so he'd be ready to go caving. I then hatched some more Rexes, and the first three were all pretty terrible and weren't useful for bosses, so I killed them. The fourth Rex however was a male with the HP and melee stat, which meant he would now become my new male breeder. While these grew up back at base, it was time to do some caving so I took the Abrex out to the Aberration Cave to do some exploring. At first I wondered if he would need a Haz suit to survive in here, but upon first look, it didn't appear so. Inside the Aberration Cave was a ton of Aberration creatures, such as Roll Rats, Megalos, Feverlites, Rock Drakes, etc. Well, I'll also add a battery zone to recharge your batteries. After dealing with some of the hostiles inside, I had a quick look around and did find this thing here, which when harvested actually gave Nameless Venom, so that's pretty neat. Aside from that though, I couldn't really find much else in here. I distinctly felt like I was missing something, but for now I decided to leave and take myself elsewhere, possibly coming back at a later date. While looking around for some of the caves I would come across earlier, I found this one, which I assumed would be another normal cave. To my surprise this was clearly something way bigger. While the inside was limited to one room, it consisted of three portals, each which claimed to teleport you to another land. It seemed the price to travel to these mysterious lands was five runestones each. I hadn't come across any runestones on my adventure as of yet, but now I would certainly be on the lookout for some. Leaving the portal room, I found another brand new cave, which I hadn't seen before. I believe this cave is called the Dire Bear Cave, due to the obscene amount of dire bears that spawn in here, but inside not only is it beautiful, but it's absolutely huge. If you were to build in here, you certainly wouldn't have any issues with fitting dinos in here. Probably not the best spot for a solo player, but a great spot for larger tribes. It's safe to say that between day 40 and 50, I did a lot of exploring, and soon after leaving the Dire Bear Cave, I found what I thought was another cave. Inside, however, it appeared to be some sort of shrine, most likely to all the people that have made this amazing map possible, so shout out to them. It also seemed to have a YouTuber presence in here, as Syntax got an honourable mention for some reason. A cave I did want to explore, which you might remember, was this one, which I found very early on in my 100 day journey. Now with an imprinted Rex, I decided it was time to check this cave out. Inside however, I couldn't actually find very much. The architecture of the cave was very cool, but I couldn't help feel they'd missed a trick here by not adding magma saws at the bottom of this lava pit. I wasn't sure if the things on the wall were actually element shards, so you have to let me know in the comments about that. The final room itself was very pretty, but there didn't seem to be anything at the end of it. But there didn't seem to be anything at the end of it, such as a loot crate or an artifact. So after looking around for a while longer, I ended up leaving. I'm sure there probably is more to this place than meets the initial eye, but I initially just couldn't find much going on. On day 50, I went in search of some beaver dams for some cementing paste. The reason I wanted this paste was to make a cliff platform to store my flyers on, most of which were pretty useless by this stage of the game. I then made an industrial forge, but held off placing it for now, as I wasn't sure if I was going to make a full-on crafting station at a later date. After a bit of research online, it turned out that I sure enough had managed to miss something quite glaring in the Aberration Cave, so I returned with my Ab Cave Rex to get it. It turns out this cave has the artifact of the Stalker, which I managed to miss due to the fact it is located quite high up on this pillar. With the assistance of my grapples, which thankfully this Aberration Cave allows you to use, I grabbed the artifact of the Stalker. A cave I had almost forgotten about was this cave, located at the bottom of the Fire Wyvern Trench. I was pretty sure this cave must lead to the Magma Saw Trench, but I decided I wanted to check it out. 
Whether or not this will actually be in the official release of Fjordor, I don't know, as the ARC devs have a track record of removing DLC creatures from free maps. Inside the cave, I found out that it was indeed a magma soul pit, but I couldn't hang around for too long, as even though I was completely naked, I was losing health at a rapid rate. If you are going in there, it's probably best to bring med brews. That night, I visited the snow cave. It's safe to say that I had to research to find this cave, as I would never have found this entrance without doing so. Inside was meant to contain the artifact of the hunter, one of the artifacts needed to do the broodmother. The wyvern didn't fit through this gap, however you could actually fly in this cave, so I threw it back out inside. The only issue was the artifact of the hunter wasn't spawning where it was meant to. I wasn't sure if perhaps this was a bug or a recent change, so instead I went exploring. My wyvern couldn't fit up this bit, so instead I went on foot. At the end of the tunnel, it looked like a dead end, only for this rock to look suspiciously breakable. Sure enough, this was the case, and after breaking down the rock, I made it into these tunnels. Situated at the end of these tunnels was a dark pit full of piranhas. You couldn't see a thing in this pit, but this is actually another entrance into this cave, where you drop down from the top into the pool of piranhas. I'm quite glad I took the entrance I did. Leaving the piranhas in a haste, I stopped off at this yellow drop to grab its contents, and then grappled back to my wyvern. Situated halfway up between the two waterfalls, you will find this chest. It is these chests that you have a chance of finding runestones from. Sadly for me, this time I only had skins, but these chests do respawn so you can come back and farm it over and over again. After being unlucky not to get any runestones, thankfully I had a bit of luck, as the artifact had finally decided it wanted to spawn, so I grabbed myself the artifact of the hunter. Returning to base, I had another rex hatching session. In order to do the bosses, I wanted to make sure I had 15 plus imprinted rexes with the best stats, as if I went in underprepared, I would have no second chance. I then finally decided to place down the industrial forge we had previously made, opting not to go for a full on crafting station, as I wouldn't have the time or need to utilise it. One thing that I was in need of was a better breeding station, as hatching this many rex eggs in base was becoming increasingly difficult. I set out a 5x5 in stone foundations and put railings around the edges. I then placed down a new generator with wires, followed by three more air conditioners and a refrigerator. With the breeding station complete, I grabbed some obsidian, which I then used to make these artifact pedestals, to store my collection of artifacts on. At the start of day 60, I began by sorting my rex army out. I started to move the rexes that I would be using for bosses closer to the gate, so that I knew that they were rexes in need of levelling before ready to do any boss. I also sorted the breeding rexes out, keeping the best females for breeding, to give me a better chance of getting the best stats possible, and set the rexes up to breed to get more eggs. I then unlocked a complete set of scuba gear and crafted some up. I did this because after doing some research, it appeared that I would need to go underwater to grab some of the artifacts to do bosses. Before leaving base however, I hatched the latest batch of rexes, keeping the better ones for bosses and using the obsolete ones as a way to level up my fully grown rexes, which were in much need of levelling. After running out of baby rexes to slaughter, I took the next boss rex to the area just outside of base, which was teeming with dinos, making sure to keep a wide bear for the alpha rex which was nearby. The next day, after finishing levelling some rexes, I headed out into the snow biome to look for the artifacts of Devourer. This was located in an underwater cave just below this iceberg right here. I entered the cave and was immediately scared off by the eels. However, after realising that I had to somehow grab this artifact, I braved up and entered the cave again. By this point I had fully committed to going deeper into the cave and I realised that something wasn't right. The sheer amount of hostiles in here was just crazy. I think this is because early in my Fjordor journey I was having issues with dino spawns, so I had the spawn count to 2. While it was now back at 1, I think as this cave hadn't been rendered in during that time, the numbers of the creatures were still through the roof. Thankfully for me, Sarkos are actually pretty speedy, and there was nothing in here that could keep up with me, although I did have to be careful of jellyfish and eels. The issue was, upon reaching where the artifact should have been, just like the artifact of the hunter, it wasn't there. With no time to hang around, I had to exit the cave and come back again the next day. Returning into the cave, the number of hostiles didn't seem to have changed, but thankfully this time, the artifact had finally decided to spawn. By the skin of our teeth, we managed to make it out of the cave, and the Sarko further cemented its position as being a legend of the channel. The next couple of days... Yeah, I made a bit of an error with this one. I thought I pressed record on my recording software, only to find out later that I'd not done so, so sorry about that. All you really missed out upon was me taming a mate boosted pair of Deodons, and returning to the artifact of the Hunter Cave to grab some more runestones. I mated the Rexes once more, as I was still about 4-5 to five good Rexes away from having enough to take on the bosses, before heading out to another Fjordor Cave. I'd purposely put this cave off for as long as possible, as the opening bit involved having to make these jumps over lava. As you can imagine, on a hardcore challenge that you've already put 40 hours into, this was probably my worst nightmare at this point. You're actually taking small damage during this jumping bit also, but this does stop as you advance further into the cave. After getting past the jumping stage thankfully, I threw up my Rex and dealt with the hostiles on my way to the first artifact in this cave, which was the Artifact of the Clever. On the way back, I took a rather risky leap of faith with my Rex, before cryoing him up in order to reach the next part of the cave. The second section of this cave can be reached by grappling past this lava waterfall, which I did, immediately throwing my Rex out for protection. On this side of the cave, you can find the artifact of the pack, 
which is needed to do the Mega Pithecus boss fight. I'd managed to survive getting into this cave, but I now had to survive getting out. I'm not sure if I did try grappling in this first section, but I won't be surprised if you can't use the grapples here, as with a few of the Fjordor caves, that is the case. Thankfully, despite this last jump being particularly nerve-wracking, I managed to get out scot-free. I could happily say that I was never coming back to this cave. No offence to creators of Fjordor, it's a really well-designed cave, just not the type of place I want to be in a hardcore challenge. At base, I finally decided to make an industrial grill, which would certainly be needed to feed up the pigs, as well as me, before then claiming what would be the final bunch of Rexes. I disposed of the ones that weren't needed, before heading out into the snow biome to look for drops. While looking for drops, I found this really cool fort type place. I'm not sure if there is an easy way to close these places off and make them into a home, but I'm sure if there is, these places will be very popular within the PvE community. Anyway, the reason I was drop hunting, and in particular hunting every single red drop down, was that to do any boss fight, I would first need a Rex blueprint. After spending day and night searching for a Rex blueprint, with no luck, I decided to take a short break and tame up this Utah Rhinus, which I of course needed to buff the Rexes while in the boss fight. I then went back to checking red drops. I had originally been checking yellows also, but I'm pretty sure Rex BPs only spawn in red drops, so after a while I only began checking these. However, after spending multiple days searching up and down the map in every different biome, I was still having no luck. There was absolutely no chance I could do the alpha bosses without a Rex blueprint, but with no luck I decided to take a break once more, and came across this small cave. I only briefly checked this out as I didn't have my Rex on me, but I wish I'd come back to it as honestly it looked pretty cool. What I had originally been looking for was the portal cave's entrance, as I decided a break from the Rex blueprint hunt in some other world would be a nice change of scenery. I opted to go for Valheim, as judging by the description it seemed the most noob friendly. After being teleported to Valheim I had no clue what to expect, but upon arriving I was immediately struck by the appearance of the world. It was fairly big, perhaps a quarter of the size of the island map for example, and seemed to have little predators. I found this nice little cave here and I'm once again wondering if these are element shards. I couldn't harvest them with my pick, but I can't remember if that's normal and if only Ankies can harvest them, so you have to let me know. One of the main attractions of Valheim was the Poison Wyvern Trench. Similar to the Fire Wyvern Trench on Lava Island, these trenches were seemingly inhabited by only Poison Wyverns, and after looking around for a brief time, I found this 170 Poison Egg, which I decided to nab. Even after exiting the trench, my curiosity got the better of me, and I headed back in there to have a further look around. This was almost a critical error, as after venturing further in, it seems that you get dismounted after going so far. Obviously, the Fjordor devs wanted to make getting Wyvern eggs a bit harder than just simply flying in and flying off, which I commend them for, honestly. What saved my life in this situation is the mod has obviously not quite been programmed in the same way as main arc maps have, as you can get straight back on the fly after being dismounted. While being chased by about 5 poison wyverns, I just simply had to keep getting back on my wyvern after it kept dismounting me every couple of seconds. This was just enough to get me out of trouble, but my curiosity had nearly ended this challenge early, so it was safe to say I wouldn't be returning to the poison wyvern trench. The other site of Valheim I wanted to see was what I believe is a forest titan cave, judging by these statues outside at least. Sadly, I didn't bring my Rex with me, so this, ca this cave expedition stopped within about 5 seconds, but judging by the levels of dinos in this cave, I think it's fairly safe to say that you can summon and perhaps even tame the forest titan from within that cave. Satisfied that I had seen most of what Valheim had to offer, I returned to the overworld, where I continued my search for a Rex blueprint. I was finding Ferrazino and many other types of saddle, but I was yet to even see a Rex saddle, let alone a blueprint. On day 89 however, my luck changed. From a red drop, I found this Apprentice Rex blueprint with 68 armour, which, by the way, is a very good apprentice saddle. I immediately brought the blueprint back to base as we had now reached day 90. Back at base, I claimed my poison wyvern, which was incredibly average, aside from having a good stamina start, and then got to work with levelling our boss rexes and getting the final bits ready for the alpha broodmother. I decided to bring the Rexes to a common drop location that I had noticed opposite base, rather than doing the long trip to the Green Obelisk. For the most part, this went pretty well. Bye, With the UC recovered and the Rexes in position, it was then just a question of waiting for a drop to come down. While waiting, I took a quick detour to the Hunter Cave once more, and got lucky once again finding runestones in the chest. 
The next morning, after a bit of a wait, a red drop began to come down just outside the base and we were ready to take on our first boss. I got all the Rexes in position, ready to go, and... It was at this moment that he knew. He fucked up. So, yeah, I messed up. I didn't have all the artifacts. For some reason, I thought it was the artifacts of the pack to see the broodmother, when that's actually used for the monkey. So either way, I was now short of the artifacts of the massive. And after a quick online search, I didn't fancy going for that right away. So instead of this, I returned to the portal room and went for a quick holiday to Asgard, which is described as paradise in its portal description. Upon arriving in Asgard, I immediately found this Genesis 2 inspired area, which are shadow mains. So that's why you need to come if you want to tame shadow mains on Fjordor. I was also immediately struck by the amount of pure flat land that Asgard has. So as a builder, it probably is paradise. Similar to Valheim, it didn't take me long to find this suspicious looking cavern. While I hadn't had the opportunity to visit the snow portal yet, I assumed Asgard would be the home of lightning wyverns, with the snow world housing ice wyverns. Sure enough, after entering the realm and being kicked off by Wyvern, I found out it was indeed Lightning Wyvern Trench. I absolutely love it when these things can still hurt you, even in death. I hadn't actually brought my Rex in here with me, and I couldn't fly in here, only walk. So I decided to explore the trench further, which probably had been a bad idea. On the way out, I noticed this hallway, so I decided to check out what was down it. At the end of the hallway, there was this little golden creature thing you could interact with. I'm pretty sure this is where you can summon the Desert Titan, and I think there may also be an artifact behind these doors also. Not sure about you, but that seems quite expensive you have to spend 3 full artifacts and 10 runestones to even reach it. Content with my Asgard break, I returned to the overworld to go after the artifacts of the massive. At base, I made sure to make some shotgun bullets, as I had seen all sorts of weird creatures on YouTube that were apparently guarding this artifact. The entrance to this cave is actually underwater, so after cryoing my wife in midair, I put on my scuba and popped out my Sarko before entering the cave, which can be found at this point on the screen on the map. Inside the cave, I actually had to use a mix of my wife and grapples to get up to this bit, before throwing my Rex out at the very top. I wasn't on my Rex for long however, when I found out he could go no further, and I descended underground into this rather spooky maze type place. Inside this place was a ton of different booby traps, which ranged from trank arrows being shot at you, to spikes on the floor which if you walked over took out great amounts of your health. It also had these weird human like monsters which would randomly run at you from time to time. To get the artifacts, you first had to find these different coloured objects around the place, which all had a number next to them. The numbers represented the order you pushed the coloured buttons at this area here. After successfully finding out the order, I pushed all the buttons, which then opened another door. Down in the second chamber, I heard the sound of what I thought was the artifact, only to be rather disappointed when I found out it was just a gold cave drop. The second segment followed the exact same methodology as the first one, which was tracking down the colours and the numbers. From there, I had to push the buttons in a certain order, which opened up the door to the artifacts of the massive. After I went in, it turns out the door closes behind you, so I was wondering how on earth I was meant to get out of this one. Turns out there is a hidden button on the wall, which duly opened the door in front of me. I then retraced my steps through the first section and found my way back to my Rex. Back at the entrance of the cave, I cried both my Wyvern and my Rex and then swam out of the entrance. Back at base, it was now simply a case of waiting patiently for a drop. I waited almost two in-game days and still no drop was coming down outside the base, which meant that when I saw this blue drop coming down, not far away from where the Rexes were positioned, I quickly got them all on follow and brought them over to it. This time, we weren't missing anything. As I activated the arena and brought what I thought were the final Rexes into the circle, we prepared to fight the Alpha Broodmother. The Broodmother is best on a multiplayer with Megatheriums due to the buff that they get from killing the spiders. However, when you're solo, Rexes are your best bet. After being teleported into the arena, it started off fairly well, with me whistling attack this target on the Broodmother and jumping on the ET to boost my Rexes. However, things did soon take a turn for the worse when I tried to get this wandering Rex involved in the fight, only for my poor low level UT with a primitive saddle to get swarmed by spiders. As the UT was absolutely mauled, the Rexes came to my help, so I jumped on this one and got back in the action. I was anxiously looking around as all the Rex's HP were getting low, but in the end, even without the UT and about 3-4 Rex's that I had left behind, the fight went pretty well. Had I not made those saddles however, we would have had absolutely no chance. With the Broodmother fight done, I immediately set my sights on the Alpha Monkey. The only artifact I was missing was the artifact of the Brute, so I tamed up this Megatherium to go caving with. The reason I did this was because the Brute is located in the Swamp Cave, found on the Swamp Island. Like the Island Swamp Cave, you have to wear full scuba or a combination of scuba and ghillie in here to survive. You can probably also use gas masks or hazmat suits in here. Unlike the island swamp cave however, the Fjordor swamp cave is absolutely huge. I had to grapple up to the brute artifacts I saw no way my mega would fit up here, and then I swiftly left the cave as things were ticking on towards day 100. Even with all the artifacts secured, I was still missing a few things, so I used the pigs to heal the rexes up a bit, and then farmed up some megalodon teeth, megalania toxin, and spino cells. After finally gathering all the stuff, a purple drop came right down in the same place I had done the brute mode fight. After doing some last minute heals and getting all the Rexes in line, we were finally ready to. It was at this moment that he knew. He fucked up. Yeah, okay, I messed up again. Luckily the Redwood Biome was right nearby, and I quickly grabbed the Phyla Claws. 
it is now day 102 now, so we'll have to catch you guys in the next one. Naughty, naughty. You teasing me, you naughty, naughty. <laughs> Just joking, I wouldn't leave you all hanging like that. Although I do think those two extra days of content deserve a like on the video. With everything secured for real this time, the original drop had of course despawned, but one had decided to spawn right outside of base, so I brought the Rexes right back up the hill for one last time. We were all ready to go, and thus I began the countdown to the Alpha Mega Pificus Arena. Loading into the fight, it was neat to see that the Fjordor Arena was quite similar to the Island Arena, but being redone in its own charming way. So, kudos to the devs for doing that. As a whole, the Mega Pificus is actually a lot easier than the Broodmother, and despite a slight accident, which definitely wasn't meant to happen, we did defeat the second Alpha boss, and bring an end to our long 100 days on Fjordor. Thank you for watching my 100 day journey on Fjordor. I hope you've enjoyed following it as much as I have making it. When I first started on Fjordor, I was confident that a seasoned Dark player such as myself would be able to explore every last inch of this map within the time frame. Yet, here we are, on day 102, and still there is so much to do. If the desire is there for a 200 days of Fjordor video, it is something that we'll consider making in the coming months. So be sure to let me know in the comments if that's something that would interest you. For the time being, it's time to turn my attention elsewhere, and I have lots of exciting content coming your way. Like I mentioned at the start, please do head over to my Twitch and give me a follow there. I'll be streaming from next week, and my next 100 days challenge will be starting then. Thanks for all the support, and I'll see you in another 3-4 weeks for another video. Stay safe, and have a great day.